If you grab your Bibles and stand with me if you can. We're in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Matthew writes, And I also say to you, Jesus is speaking to Peter, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And I will give you the kings of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be already loosed literally in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus, the Messiah. And from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go up to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and be killed and be raised again on the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. Whoa. You are an offense to me when you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life, hoard it, will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each man according to his kingdom. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, his clothes became as white as light, and behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make three tabernacles or tents or chapels, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him, Peter. <laughs> and then the disciples heard it, and they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, and do not be afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Now as they came down from heaven, the mountain, excuse me, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. Stop there and pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word we desire to understand. So we pray that you would send your spirit to teach us, give us understanding so that we, we might know you better and love you more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated, please. Mountaintop experiences. Mountaintops. I was uh, rereading a book this week by Peter Jenkins. He's a newspaper man who decided to hike across America. And that's the name of it, his walk across America. And he was a uh, non-believer when he left L.A. and headed towards the East Coast. And he said everything went fine until he got to a little town in Alabama outside of Mobile. And uh, there was a large tent in downtown of this little town. And it said across the front of it, Revival. Now, he'd never been to a revival. He'd never been to church before. And so uh, he decided to go in. And he went in an atheist, and he came out a believer <laughs> to this little tent revival. And when he was down praying at the altar, uh, a woman came up, and uh, she stared at me with probing eyes, he said, trying to figure out what I was feeling and thinking. Peter, she said, this great elation that you're feeling now. Then she looked at me, and she said, you are feeling an elation, aren't you? And he said, yes. And uh, she said, uh, 
Her voice became soft and she said, at this very moment, it may seem like these great feelings are going to last forever, but they won't. Being a Christian is not based on feelings. You're on a mountaintop right now, but someday, sooner or later, you'll be far away from these great feelings. And you may even wonder if all this ever happened. Your Christian walk is based on faith and not feelings. Peter, 10 years later, wrote, I was on a mountaintop that night. The feelings lasted a long time, but that mountaintop hasn't lasted all these years. Maybe I've been on more mountaintops than some, but I've also climbed and sometimes crawled out of some awful steep valleys too. So this section we just read from Matthew chapter 16 and 17 is probably the greatest mountaintop experience that anyone has ever had. These three disciples went with Jesus and they saw him with his humanity un, unhindered and he became God in front of them. And it was because they needed a mountaintop experience that they would draw from over the next weeks and months ahead, years, decades down the road. Often that's what mountaintop experiences are for all of us. I've learned over the years that when I find myself in a particularly spiritual time, and it feels wonderful, I remember that it often leads to tests. And so I've learned to say to myself, don't let your highs be too high, and don't let your lows be too low, because whatever you're feeling right now is going to change. <laughs> and it always happens so far. So... This particular section is about that, about what it takes to make it in the long run with Jesus. And somebody stopped me last week and was upset because difficult things were happening to them. And, uh, and I reminded them that it is by faith and not by feelings. They said, but I, I thought when I became a Christian, everything was going to be wonderful. <laughs> And I couldn't help but laugh a little bit. I said, well, it is wonderful in the sense of you're going to heaven. You know the creator of the universe. He's blessing your life. But that doesn't mean you get a pass on all the difficult things in life. In fact, sometimes when you become a believer, it gets more difficult. So here we are looking at uh, the great mountaintop experience of the disciples. This little section breaks up into three parts. Peter's wrong answer, he gave a great answer in the verse before where we broke in. We looked at last week, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, heaven and earth haven't given that to you. This is, I mean, uh, earth and, and physical things haven't told you that, but this is from heaven. This is my heavenly father that has told you these things. So Peter's excited, but he's going to blow it here, 18 through 23, and then Jesus' command to follow him, what it means to follow Jesus, 24 through 28. And then the first nine verses of chapter 17, seeing his weight, his display of power, who Jesus really is. So that's where we're going. It's a fun scripture, and um, it will help us all. Get ready for coming things in our lives. Verse 18. So Jesus has just said, Peter, you did great. You said, I am the Christ, the son of the living God. That's true. Your heavenly father told you. Now, and I also say to you that you are Peter. The word is Petros in the Greek language. And on this rock, Petra, and the, both are the word rock, One's a small rock, male, masculine, Peter is Petros. And on this rock, Petra, which is feminine, which is like the city of Petra, a huge rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, I grew up in a church that taught this was Jesus telling Peter he was going to be the first pope. I know, I know. And uh, 
So, uh, but to mean, to be a pope means you speak ex cathedral, which is a Latin term for perfect without any error. And so Peter's going to last about three minutes before he starts erring here. So Jesus is not saying that Peter himself is the rock. And without going into all the Greek language, you can't have a a masculine uh, rock and a feminine rock in the same sentence and mean the same rock. It does not. So what's the rock Jesus is talking about? Well, what Peter just said. That Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God. That's the only, you don't get anything else this morning, get this. That's the only foundation, the only reliable rock that any person can stand on in life. Got a verse for that, Pastor? Yeah, 1 Corinthians 3.11. For no other foundation... Can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ? He's the foundation. It's not on a member of some clergy. It's not a denominational thing. It's Jesus Christ is the only foundation. You want peace in your life. You want significance. You want joy. Jesus at the center of your life will bring all those things and more. I will build my church. This is the first time the word church appears in the New Testament. And there's a rule there that whenever it's used the first time in the New Testament, it'll be used the same way throughout the New Testament. The word is ecclesia. It means called out once. You know, when we're talking, we say, well, this church. No, this building is not a church. You are the church. You are, in fact, the called out ones that God is talking about here. And you will um, be safe. The gates of Hades shall not prevail against you. Now, when I was a brand new Christian, I read that. I thought, do I have to run from gates? Because these gates are pursuing us. (laughs) Something like that. But, But gates are for defense. So... What is this gate of hell? Well, when you go to Israel, and if you haven't been there, you need to go, because when you visit ancient cities in Israel, the city gates are filled with seats all the way around. When you come into this city of Dan, there's this gate, and it has all these seats around, because the elders of that city would sit in the gates. It was like a courtroom. It was there that decisions were made. If you had a beef with your neighbor, you'd go to the city gate, and there the strategies of how to work it out were laid out for you and your neighbor. So this is saying the strategies of hell will not be successful against you. That doesn't mean that you won't have hard times. We've already covered that. But that God will protect you and they shall not prevail. Those strategies will not prevail in your life. So God has called us to become warriors. First of all, he calls us to be disciples. And then he calls us to be worshipers, which is what we did already when we were singing to him. But then he also calls us to be warriors, that you and I are in a battle. And that battle is focused against us, Ephesians 6.12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness. 2 Corinthians 10.4 For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. There's that idea of these strategies against you. So the gates are where the strategies are invented against you, put together by hell. But God wants us to know that he will take care of us. That we will be safe from 
in this case, the big picture. Verse 19, and I will give you, Jesus speaking to his disciples, you is plural, I will give you all the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Okay. Now, again, the church I grew up in says that this was talking to Peter and the other apostles who would be the clergy of the church, and that if they would loose people from their sins, they'd be free from them, and if they bound them, they would be stuck with them. This is not talking about sin. And again, you are the clergy. What? We belong to a priesthood of believers. Peter himself wrote, you are a holy priesthood. You are a clergy. Well, what's a priest? A pre- the word priest means bridge builder. You are a bridge builder. You are building a bridge between someone who does not know God and someone who does. God himself. (laughs) And he wants to use you to bring other people to him. So in that sense, you are a priest. Now, what's with the key? Well, in that day, the scribes. Now, we've run into the scribes several times. Those are the guys that copied a new copy of the Old Testament. They would sit down with the vellum and they'd roll it out and they'd start Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And they'd write it out. And they'd work their way all the way through the Bible. So they became very proficient in understanding the Bible. And if you were a scribe, they gave you a key to put on your belt. You'd have this little key hanging down. That's what Jesus is saying here. They had the keys to the knowledge of Scripture, God's Word. It wasn't that they could change God's Word. It wasn't uh, that they had somehow some kind of power to do something different than what God said. But they reminded people of what the Bible said. Well, this verse applies to what you're going through. You are called to do the same thing. That's what Jesus is saying. But I'm giving you the keys of the kingdom That's why we study God's word, so we'll know what to do ourselves as well as as you grow in the Lord, tell other people about it. And whatever you bind on earth is already bound in heaven, the tense of the verb says, because it's already in the Bible, it's already locked in. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. We looked at that last time. So it's really not complicated. It's pretty straightforward that you become a repository of information about what God says is right and what's not. Hmm, that's kind of scary. No, he wants us to make it real with other people. Be real and transparent before them. It's okay to say, and some of you have gotten this from me, well, what does this verse mean? And I'll say, you know, I'm not really positive. Let me go back and look at it, and I'll tell you. Got email address or whatever. It's okay to say, I'm not sure, I'll go look it up. In fact, I would much rather have somebody do that than just answer off the top of their head and get it wrong, right? Okay, so that's fine for you to do that too. Then he commanded his disciples, verse 20, that they should tell no one that he's the Messiah, that he was Jesus, the Messiah. It wasn't time yet. He didn't want them announcing something he didn't completely understand yet, that he was going to die. And that's where he's going with this whole conversation. From that time, Jesus began to show, this is 21, to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, the religious center of the nation, and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and scribes, from those who ran the Jewish religion, and be killed and be raised again the third day. So the disciples should not have been surprised when that happened to Jesus because he started saying it months before it happened. Here he is saying it. Peter only heard killed. He did not hear raised the third day. And so Peter has been told that he was rocky. That's what he's thinking, right? I'm My name is now Rocky. (laughs) 
I should have played the music right then. You, know. <laughs> you got it in your head, though. So Sylvester Stallone, verse 22. Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. That's not a good word. <laughs> Peter's talking to God the Son. Peter's pretty confident. We might say overconfident at this moment. And he decides to rebuke Jesus Christ. And he says, far be it from you, Lord. This shall not happen to you. (laughs) Jesus just prophesied he was going to die and be raised from the dead. Peter said, nah. Nah, I I understand these things you don't, Lord. (laughs) Well, um, that didn't work out too good. Uh, Jesus responds straight ahead. Verse 23. And he turned, he said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. (laughs) Ouch. Put yourself in Peter's sandals. He's just been declared rocky. He thinks he's got it all together. And Jesus calls him Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of man. So Peter gets this really, really wrong. And the other disciples are probably listening going, I'm glad I didn't say that. (laughs) And Jesus uh, tells Peter that uh, he'd missed it completely. But Peter's not through. It'll happen again in the next chapter. Verse 24. And Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come out, you want to be my followers, you want to be my disciples, then let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Three things. Deny himself. Deny what you want to do. Take up his cross, something that you would choose to do, and follow Jesus. You're 25 years old, you just got your college degree, and you want to do plan A. And God speaks to you and says, no, I have something else for you to do. What do you do? Do you ignore God, do you say, get behind me, Satan? (laughs) Do you choose to do what you want to do, have it your way? Or do you follow him? It's really being laid out really strongly here, very clearly. Deny yourself. There was a scribe, guy with a key, right, in Matthew 8, 19. And we went through it rather quickly. But there it says, then a scribe, said to him, Jesus, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Pretty confident. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. I don't even have a house. You sure you want to follow me? Jesus was not saying, don't follow me. He's saying, count the cost. It might cost you greatly. And then this verse 25, he says, whoever desires to save his life, you could change the word to hoard, hold on to your life. Save it for yourself is the point. Whoever decides to hoard his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life, give it away to Jesus, whatever he wants them to do. For my sake, we'll find it. Okay. So I think every psychiatrist, every psychologist, every counselor, every high school and college counselor, every philosopher should consider this claim of Christ on people's lives. He's saying that uh, the more you live for yourself, to put it very simply, the more miserable you'll be. I see the world starting to understand that. More and more, I, I have some liberal friends who aren't Christians, and they want to know where they can go to work in a soup kitchen and help homeless people and, and, and just work with people who are in great need. And, and that's good. That's a good thing. But it's only part of it. If you're not doing it in God's timing, in the way God wants you to do it, You're just trying to make yourself feel good. So what he's saying is surrender to him. Give him your life. Put him first 
and he'll direct your life into things that are right. But if you give away your life to Jesus, then you'll find significance, direction, peace, joy, and eternity in him. Look at verse 26. It's even more pointed. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? This is the worst bargain in the entire Bible. The whole world you could gain but lose your soul for eternity. What good would that do you? So what could you exchange for eternity? What thing, what position, what title, what amount of money would you take for your soul for eternity? It doesn't make sense, okay? So... What if someone gave you a Lamborghini? Would you say, I'll take it and I'll spend eternity separated from God? Idiot. (laughs) Even the timing of it doesn't make any sense, right? Well, if I had a certain kind of airplane or boat or home, vacation home, if I had a certain job title, if I had a certain amount of money. What amount of money is enough to throw your life away for eternity? This is like permanent, right? Some people are that stupid because they... Did I just insult you? That's good that you're here then. (laughs) Because... Even just the timing of it doesn't make sense. It's a bad bargain. It's like Esau sold his birthright to his brother for a bowl of lentil soup. That was stupid. That's a stupid move. So, when I was in school, Raylan and I were in school in Switzerland for a while, there was a missionary that came and spoke at one of our chapels. And he had worked in Micronesia, which is the islands above Australia where these kids that were singing came from. And uh, there's 2,000 nations there that are just small island nations. And he used that opportunity to tell us how to catch a monkey. That was the title of his message. And uh, yes, they eat monkey. Monkey tacos, monkey burgers. <laughs> and uh, he showed me some slides of the monkeys. And when they barbecue and they put them on a spit and they get some interesting facial expression. So anyway, you, you can, I didn't bring pictures for you. <laughs> but here's how they catch a monkey in uh, the island of Tuja. So they take a coconut. Maybe you've heard this before. And they drill a hole in it, a three-quarter inch hole in the coconut, turn it over, get all the juice out of it, and then put two tablespoons of warm rice in it. Monkeys love rice. And then they take the coconut with the rice in it, put it down in the middle of the trail, and go home. Now, a monkey's walking along. He smells the rice. And he puts his hand in the hole that's just the right size for his head. And he grabs the rice and tries to pull it out. But the hole, the rest of the hole catches his head and he gets the whole coconut. And so monkeys have bad tempers. And so, <laughs> and so he begins to hit it on the ground. But it's green and you can't break it when it's green. And he moves around trying to find a rock. And finally, he does it up against a tree, a palm tree, coconut palm. And he's hitting it, and it's like a huge bass drum. And you can hear it all throughout the jungle. And the guy that put the coconut there hears it, and he comes. And he's looking for the monkey, and he sees him. And the monkey sees him, and he screams. He's got plenty of time and space to get away. But he wants his rice. And finally, the islander walks over, grabs him by the nape of the neck, and has him over for lunch. 
You know any people like that? I know quite a few who for money, a relationship, passion, lust, a job, something material would put their whole life in danger. How many people do you know that have overdosed with drugs and died in the last two years? Got their hand in the coconut and all they have to do is let go of the rice and they would be free. Let go of it. So Jesus is talking reality here. That's the way we all work. We're tempted to hold on to whatever it is that we think will make us happy, even to the point of losing it all. So, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? (laughs) Oh my goodness. What would you exchange eternity for? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Now, uh, there are rewards for believers, but this is speaking of the rewards for the ungodly, the eternal judgment. Assuredly, I say to you, Jesus speaking to the 12 apostles standing there, there are some standing here who shall not taste death until they see the Son of Man, that's Jesus, coming in his kingdom. Now, this is not a great translation. This is the New King James. It actually is the word majesty, coming in his majesty or coming in his royalty. Basilica is the word. So, Jesus is saying some of the men standing there are going to see him in his majesty, who he really is. And we go to verse 1. Now, after six days, Matthew gives us the exact time, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, his brother, on a high mountain by themselves, just the three of them with Jesus. Now, this is sometimes called the inner circle, Peter, James, and John, that they are the, Jesus' favorite. He took them into Jairus' house. He's going to take them into the garden. But I think it's more like my third grade teacher. She always made me stay in the classroom, not because I was her favorite. It was because I would get in trouble if I wasn't being watched, okay? So Jesus takes them up on the mountain, and uh, the mountain is probably this one. The white on the top, that's Mount Hermon in Israel. It's the most... Uh, northern and tallest peak in Israel. It's on the Syrian and uh, Lebanese border. And yes, it snows there, but you can see it's not great skiing. Those rocks tend to throw you off. (laughs) And here's what it looks like in the summer. But that's the mountain that's closest. Now here's looking due south from the top of Mount Hermon. The lake to the right is the Sea of Galilee. Now that's 11 miles by 7 miles, so it's pretty small there. And this is looking north to Lebanon, to the cities of Tyre and Sidon, and on Barut is just over the young man's left shoulder that's standing there. So this is the mountain that's just right above Caesarea Philippi where Jesus has been talking. So um, it's 9,283 feet tall. So uh, he was transfigured here. This is the Mount of Transfiguration. And the word transfigure, verse 2, is uh, the word metamorpha in the Greek language, where it's coming to the English language to metamorphize. That's a caterpillar that turns into a butterfly, a tadpole that turns into a frog, a mayfly, various metamorphoses. Um, It's speaking of becoming what you really were designed to be. Jesus is transfigured, metamorphized before them, and his face shone like the sun. His clothes became as white as light. Peter would later say that he dwells in unapproachable light in heaven. So Jesus 
If, if you interrupt a chrysalis, a caterpillar who winds himself up in a little chrysalis, uh, interrupt it from becoming a butterfly in the early stages of the first few days of it, if you open one up, it's just liquid. The messenger RNA and the DNA are going to what they were originally designed for, this butterfly with wings. That's a picture of eternity because you will fly someday too. So uh, we have this picture here of Jesus being metamorphized and transformed in front of them. Now you are being transformed right now. That's what Romans 12, 2 says. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, metamorphized, by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 2 Corinthians 2, 18. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed, metamorphized, into the same image from glory to glory. So, by faith, it comes by hearing the Word of God. And you are hearing the Word of God. That's why we study it here, so you and I will be changed to be what God intends for us to be. So, Jesus becomes who he really is in front of them, God the Son. And Moses and Elijah show up, verse 3. And he appears with him and talked with Jesus. In Luke, it says the same story that they talked with him about his death. So Moses received the law. Elijah is the greatest Hebrew prophet. So this is the law and the prophets. So Moses is talking to Jesus about law, the fulfilling of the law, that you've come, Lord, to die for the sins of every person so that the law might be fulfilled, that the penalty due to each person, death for their sins, will come on you. And the iniquities of us all were on him. And then Elijah would be saying something like, all the prophets have foretold that you would come and would come and die for us. So there's this continuity of creation. God who always was, God the Son, is appearing there in light and they're discussing his demise that he would die on a cross for our sins. I only have five more pages. You don't mind, do you? We'll just go right to lunch. No, I'm kidding. Okay. Let me uh, summarize Jesus' death. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son for you so that you might spend eternity with him. This is uh, from a book called The Grip of Grace by Brian Chapel. He writes on Sunday, August the 16th, 1987, Northwest Airlines Flight 225 crashed just after taking off from the Detroit airport on a freeway. 155 people were killed. One survived, a four-year-old little girl from Tempe, Arizona named Cecilia. News accounts say when rescuers found Cecilia, they did not believe she'd been on the plane. They thought that she was a passenger in one of the cars on the highway. But then they found the passenger registered for the flight, and there was Cecilia's name, along with her mother, Paula Chichen. Now, they found Paula's body in front of the seat. They surmised what happened is her mother unbuckled her own seatbelt, got down on her knees in front of her daughter, and wrapped her arms and body around Cecilia in the seat she was in, and then would not let go of her. That's how this little girl survived, because of her mother's love. God so loved you that if you had been the only one on the planet, he would have come and died for you. Would you stand, please, and we'll pray together.